opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we give you thanks and praise for all that has happened to us and with us throughout the course of this week and for bringing us to the end of yet another week. We thank you for your faithfulness and love which excel all we ever knew of you. We thank you for your life-giving and sustaining spirit in us. We thank you for our health and strength. We thank you for wisdom and the grace to function as you deem fit. We thank you for all the blessings of this day and all the favors we have received. We thank you for the victories we have, you have given to us, especially from unforeseen incidences. We thank you for the challenges that we have been able to surmount. We thank you because you are God. As we gather this evening to learn more of you, especially in the area of gratitude and thanksgiving, we pray that you will accept our thanksgiving this day and fill us with your spirit that at the end of the day, all glory will be yours, all adoration will be yours, all thanksgiving will be yours, and the blessings will be ours through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, good evening to everyone. Moderator, I believe I can, I can start, right? Yes, please. Go ahead, Father. Okay, great. So, let me especially welcome each and every one of us to today's Bible study session. We'll be looking at something very interesting and something very important. It is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And um, it's a very familiar concept, especially among Christians. Uh, we all talk about it. We all have some idea about um, what Thanksgiving is, what Thanksgiving is not. Uh, today, we'll be looking at it scripturally. And of course, finding out how best we all can live lives of thanksgiving, how best we can appreciate God for all that he, he is, and why thanksgiving is a vital element of our Christian well-being. My father will always say, not to say thank you for a favor received, makes one the cousin of a thief not to say thank you for a favor received is to, is, to, is to be the cousin of a thief. Very often, we look at Thanksgiving backwards. And I explain what that means. We look at Thanksgiving backwards. We think of Thanksgiving as thanking God for something that has happened to us already. So we look back at an event, and then, of course, you will agree with me that in most of our parishes, when we come to offer thanksgiving to God, there is always that temptation that we come to give thanks to God at the birth of a new child, success in business, or an exam, or recovery from ailments, recovery from accident, or whatever it is, we want to thank God. And so, most times, we get to think that thanksgiving is actually just backward looking for what has happened. However, the real purpose of Thanksgiving is actually opening doors to even greater blessings. Meaning, Thanksgiving is also forward-looking. And we'll, look, we'll see that in some of the scripture passages we'll take up today. Thanksgiving is forward-looking and not just backward-looking. So, there can, it can be put simply that there is there are two sides to the coin of thanksgiving. That which looks backward 
and of course, that which looks forward. One of the prefaces at Holy Mass tells us, our prayer of thanksgiving, which is itself God's gift, adds nothing to God's greatness, but profits us for salvation. That explains the forward-looking nature of thanksgiving. We are thanking God. It doesn't profit God anything. We thank God. It doesn't make God bigger. It doesn't make God more God, but it profits us for salvation. And then it is itself a gift from God. Our ability to thank God is God's gift to us. And I'll equally explain that. If God has not given us the gift to thank him, then it becomes all too, in fact, almost impossible to even remember to thank him. It becomes almost impossible to thank him. And so it is God's gift, first of all, to know that our ability to thank him is a gift that has been given to us by God. And it profits us for salvation. It doesn't add to God's greatness. Thanksgiving is something that we are called to do every day. A thankful heart, a grateful heart. It is something we are called to do every day. And it has to be intentional. We don't chance upon Thanksgiving. It has to be intentional. It is something that we are called to do every day, in good times and in bad times, ups and downs. Our natural response should be gratitude. And that is what we are taught. That is what the church teaches us. That is what scriptures teach us. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. We have to come each day. Thanksgiving, thanksgiving, thanksgiving. We give thanks to God, firstly, knowing that he is the giver of all things. Thanksgiving stands on three on three legs. You want to call it a tripod. First, we give thanks to God knowing that God is the giver of all things. And with emphasis, all things. Whatever you can think of, God is the giver. And so we give thanks to him. We give thanks to him because of his own faithfulness. God is constant. He doesn't flicker. So we give thanks to him for his faithfulness. And the third one, we give thanks to him because of his promise to us. So when we look back, we see how much God has brought us, especially in this year, 2020. Many of us have said we are not going to add this year to our calendar. We won't count it because we didn't make use of it. Because we, there's been so much that's taking place this year. It was, you know, the, the, the COVID-19 is still very much around with us. And then you have all sorts. You've had protests, NSAS. You've had um, the not too wonderful response from uh, Mr. President that uh, people seem to have lost faith and have all that. We have the carnage that ensued, the destruction of lives and property, even in the state of Lagos and, of course, across the country. We also have had um, uh, very difficult moments spiritually. Lockdown, we've not been able to go to the church even now and up till now. It's not yet full capacity. And it's equally this year that there might just be a second lockdown. Businesses have crashed. Students in tertiary institutions have maybe even forgotten their matric number. I don't know how many of them still remember. Might not even be able to go to school again for the rest of this year. Who knows? So this year has been filled with so much. But regardless, we are alive today. It is sufficient reason to thank God. We are thanking God because there is a tomorrow. We are thanking God for his promise. We have his promise in Matthew chapter 28. 
He says, I am with you always, yes, till the end of time. We are thanking God with him. We are thanking God because he says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, I know the plans that I have for my children, plans for their good and not of evil. So front looking, in spite of the challenges, in spite of the difficulties, we, our hearts are firmly placed on God and we continue to thank him. I would like us to, uh, the reader, to please help read um, Luke chapter 17 from verse 12 to 16. Very interesting passage of scripture. Luke 17, 12 to 16. Elector, please. I read in Jesus' name. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, from verses 12 to 16. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his feet, on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samarian, Samaritan. Then Jesus said, We're not ten lens. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except for this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, we will delve into that scripture passage in a moment. But before, before we, we look at that uh, passage quite explicitly, I would want to read from my own place here. Uh, I refer you to, I won't, take, I won't be reading everything, just pick snippets of it, from the, the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel um, chapter 1, 1 Samuel chapter 1, the story of Hannah, the story of Hannah, is a very important one in understanding what Thanksgiving is. Now, Hannah had endured years, if you read chapter 1, chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, you will get all of these um, details that I'm going to talk about here. Hannah had endured very, very years of harsh ridicule. Why? Hannah was barren. Remember from that passage of scripture that Hannah was the wife of Elkanah. But Elkanah had another wife, Penina. Penina. Now, Penina was blessed with children, and Hannah was barren. But every year, Elkanah and his entire family went to Shiloh to offer sacrifice of thanksgiving. Every year. They made it, they made it a habit of going there to offer thanks to God. Now, this is one of the areas in scriptures where I take solace in the fact that we do not necessarily need to wait for God to do something before we thank him. Hannah was constantly going to Shiloh to offer thanks even when she had no child. Her co-wife, Penina, was in the habit of mocking Hannah every time. For Penina, that joyous occasion where they go to offer thanksgiving, she used it to remind Hannah of her barrenness. And she was constantly mocking her, 
for, 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 God knows, for God knows why, because she had no child. One year after Penina had uh, driven Hannah to the point of desperation, she was embittered in soul, that Hannah, and she offered a prayer to God. If you go to First Samuel chapter 1 from verse 10, verses 10 and 11, you will see the prayer, the, the, the prayer that uh, Hannah says. In her soul, she prays, and this is what she says, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look unto the affliction of your maid servant and remember me, and not forget, but you will give your maid servant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. No razor shall come upon his head. Now, what do we notice here? That Anna went to make this bitter request from the pain of her heart because of the mockery of her co-wife. But there was something in it. The motivation for the child was not for a selfish reason. She never said to God, give me a child so that I can get back at my co-wife. Give me a child so that my co-wife can stop mocking me. This embarrassment is too much. This challenge is too much. This difficulty is too much. This mockery I can no longer take. No. Instead, she says and offers to God, give me a child. I will offer this child back to you regardless of the fact that whether God was going to give her that child or not, Hannah continued going to Shiloh to offer that thanksgiving to God. Hannah's attitude of thanksgiving was not tarnished by her oppression. It wasn't tarnished by her oppression, as some of us might expect. expect. She was being oppressed. She was being taunted. Even when they were giving... Um, the sacrifice for their offering by Elkanah, because Penina had children, she got more and her children. But Hannah had no child. And so Hannah just received a little portion that was just for herself. And she was contented, but she faithfully was doing this. Dear friends, the truth is, Thanksgiving must come from a place of poverty. Poverty in the sense in the Beatitude, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Anna was poor in spirit. Anna was not ready, was not looking at coming to, for a payback. Anna was not looking to gloat that, yes, you see, God has done this for me. No. Anna was offering thanks to God in the hope that when God blesses her even with the fruit of the womb, she will offer even bigger thanks by offering that child to God. Which means even offering the child to God means you probably no longer have the child with her. And we know the end of that story. She was blessed with Samuel and she kept her vow. She kept her promise. She offered the thanksgiving back. She offered that gift that was given to her back to God. Remember what I said that the, 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 three, the three legs on which Thanksgiving stands is that first, that God is the giver of all things. God is the giver of all things. That we have to thank God. We know that it is God who has given us the grace to thank Him. If we are thanking God for fruit of the womb, it is God who has given us. If we are thanking God for promotion in our business, in our jobs, it is God who has given us. If we are thanking God in anticipation of something that will happen, it is God who has also given it to us. Um, sometimes when I listen to some Pentecostals pray, uh, they, they tend to end their prayer in such beautiful fashion where you hear things like, thank you God for answered prayer. They've just finished the prayer. But they are thanking God for answered prayer. Forward looking. It hasn't happened, but we say with humility, we believe that it will. And that's exactly what we find in Anna's attitude. And so some of the lessons we can glean immediately from this is that God as the giver of all things, that no matter how difficult this year has been with us and for us, we are called to live a life of thankfulness. No matter how difficult. No matter how difficult. 
It means it should come from a place of poverty, poor in spirit. It should come from a place of lowliness. It should come from a place of nothingness. If you go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, our mother Mary depicts it clearly in her magnific- Magnificat, her song of thanksgiving. She had just received the promise from God and she breaks forth into joyous thanks. She breaks forth into joyous thanks and she gives us the Magnificat. He looks on his servant in her lowliness. Henceforth, all the ages will call me blessed. From that place, that is where our thanksgiving should come. From our nothingness. Our mother Mary teaches us that she, she was nothing. She knows she's nothing. Why would I, why, why, why this sort of blessing coming to God, coming to, from God to me? Those are the things that will be filling the heart of our mother Mary. Yet, she offers that. That should be the foundation. That should be the reason why we too must always give thanks to God. Another thing that we'll see from Hannah's story is that her thanksgiving was not occasional. Our thanksgiving must not be occasional. No. Our thanksgiving must not be occasional. I want it to sing. Our thanksgiving should not correspond with only the good moments that happen to us. Instead, our thanksgiving must be less. Our thanksgiving, there must be a continuous, it, has, it is a continuous flow of appreciation, a continuous flow of appreciation that we are alive, that we breathe, is reason enough to thank God. Reason and all. Every breath shall thank the Lord, shall praise the Lord. Continuous. It shouldn't be stop start. When we realize that God is a gracious giver, we must know that that giver is worthy of all things. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20 tells us Give thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks always. And Paul doesn't tell us to give thanks once in a while. He doesn't tell us to give thanks on some days of the week. He says we should give thanks always. In Romans chapter 8 verse 32, Jesus says to us, or St. Paul says to us, for God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. He did not spare his own son, but gave him for us all. Give him up. That is the reason for us to consistently be thanking God. Continuously. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, it says, God who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing from the heavenly place, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. He predestined us for the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which is freely lavished on us. These are motivations why our thanksgiving should be always, meaning for what God has done already that paid the ultimate price for us. Tetelesta, it is finished. He has paid the price for us. Enough reason. He has won salvation for us. Enough reason for us to continue to thank God. And if you look at Psalm 23, the very popular Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. He says, David says to us there, my cup overflows. My cup overflows. And why is our cup overflowing? Because God is constant. God doesn't love us once in a while. God loves us always. And so that love of God, which is constant, that he loves us even while we were still sinners. He died for us should be a motivation for us to be thankful, to be thankful. And so our thanksgiving to God must be ceaseless. It must be continuous. It must be never ending. It has to be based on our, on, our, on, on, on our understanding of God's faithfulness. If we know that God is faithful, if we know that what he says he will do, he will do. What God cannot do does not exist. If we know that of our God, then our thanksgiving must be constant, must be continuous. 
must be continued. And see, when we talk about Thanksgiving here, I'm not talking about maybe just trying to offer gifts or offer items, either monetary or material things uh, to God. No, 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 no. No. A life of Thanksgiving is a life that is dominated by gratitude, humility, and lack of complaint. A life of thanksgiving is a life that is dominated by gratitude to God for everything, good or bad. A life of thanksgiving is a life that is continuously humble, that recognizes that God is God. A life of thanksgiving is marked by a lack of complaint, that is contentment. And I'll touch on this last point a little more. Let's, if you go, let's go to the scriptures and look at the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden, he gave them everything, every single thing, and gave them one command. Eat, drink, be merry, have a great time. But you see this tree in the middle of the garden, please do not touch. Do not eat, for the day you eat it, you will die. And the serpent came. At that point, there was harmony between God and man. There was harmony between God and, there was harmony between man and God. There was harmony between man and man, and there was harmony between man and nature. These three levels of harmony. The harmony between man and God. God was coming to fellowship with them in the garden. The harmony between Adam and Eve, they were in love. When Adam saw Eve, Adam became a sweat. This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And there was harmony between man and nature. The wild animals were not devouring anybody, was not destroying anybody. And there was, there was harmony, a lot of harmony. But what happened? When the, when the serpent came, the serpent said to Eve, did God say to you that if you eat this of this tree, you will die. He said, yeah, the day you eat it, you die. And the serpent said, false, you will not die. Because God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Now, let's hold on there. Now, what did the serpent say to, to them? That when you eat of this tree, of this fruit, you will not die, but your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Lack of contentment was what pushed them to eating that fruit. Lack of contentment. They were no longer contented with being human beings. They were not contented with being creatures created in the image and likeness of God. They now desired to become creators. Lack of contentment. And what happened? Immediately, the fruit was pleasing to the eye. Those three things, we must always be careful. The pride, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And because of that, they ate. And they ate this fruit. And what happened? You will notice what happened. Instantly, complaints started. When God came and said, Adam, Adam, where are you? Immediately, Adam says, I'm hiding. Where are you hiding? I'm naked. Who told you you were naked? Have you been eating of the tree that I forbade you? Complaint started. It was not me. It is the woman you gave to me. Before now, that same woman was bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. But an ungrateful heart that was not contented wanted to become creator and no longer creature. And so, disharmony entered instantly. Is the woman. And then God went to the woman. Woman, what is this you've done? Instantly, she also started complaining. It is not me. It is the serpent. Disharmony between man and nature took place. And as I said, a, a, a grateful heart is a contented heart. A grateful heart will not begin to give God timeline. God, do this for me. God, do it this way. Some people come to God and tell God and do it as if it's a, you, are, you are entering, you are, want to do what you call, you want to play Baba Jabu with God. God, do this and I will do this. Just like um, somebody who said to God, God, if I get well, I will build a grotto for the parish. And she was sick for several years. 
it, you have the means of building the growth too. But I want to be well first. God, when I get well, I will build the growth. And then she died, not building the grotto, obviously not getting. She died from the illness. We cannot come to God like that. We have to be contented. Full stomach, empty stomach. That's what our reading told us today. The reading of St. Paul to the Philippians. In lack, in plenty, and in want, we give thanks to God. Very, very vital. And so, dear friends, God's faithfulness is the motivation for us to be grateful to God. And trusting in God's promises is the foundational motivation for us to thank God. If you go to Joel chapter 2, verse 25, the Lord tells us, the years that have been eaten by the locusts, I will restore. The years eaten by the locusts. That is, that's a promise that God has made. Jesus says, till heaven and earth pass away, not one stroke, not one dot of the world will depart without it being fulfilled. And just as the rain will leave the earth and will not return with, before, without it wetting the floor, the earth, so my words will not go back to me without fulfilling what, that for which it was sent. God's promise is enough to thank God. Is enough to thank God for his promise. It, it hasn't come to pass, but it's enough to thank God. You should thank God for his promises. He has said, I will restore to you the years eaten by the locust. For many of us, 2020 is a year that has been so devoured by the locust. Some have lost jobs. Some have lost friends. Some have lost their means of livelihood. Some businesses have crashed so much. Some are scared. But God says, I will restore to you the years that have been eaten by the locusts. Do we believe it? If we believe it, we will give thanks. If we believe in his promises, we will give thanks. But if we don't believe, you know, I, I, I get to say to people sometimes that when somebody just makes us an ordinary promise, uh, you, your son has just finished school, your daughter has just finished school, and a friend of yours who's a top manager in some company says, okay, I'm going to help your son secure a good job. Immediately, you start thanking the person. Just tell him to send his CV to me, and then I'll see what I can do. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, man. God bless you, man. It's, and then we are thanking the person profusely. The person has not helped us with the job yet. Promise. And we thank them. How about God, who is faithful, who is constant? Who is constant? Job chapter 2 tells us, if we accept happiness from the Lord, must we not accept sorrows too? The Lord gives, the Lord takes. So our lives must be one of thanksgiving. No story in all the Gospels speak of man's ingratitude than the story that we read in Luke's Gospel chapter 17, from verse 12 to 16. The story of the ten lepers. Jesus comes into this village, this certain this village, and is accosted by 10 lepers, 10 lepers who come to him and they did not ask to be healed. They say, they say to him, have mercy on me. They didn't say heal me. Because at the time, leprosy was synonymous with death. You are near death. It, is, it, it was heightened. The pain and the exclusion that came with leprosy was heightened by societal norms. You were not supposed to come around in the open. You were not supposed to mingle with people. You, you, you face the risk of being stoned if they see you in the public market. Because, and it was so infectious. And the way it takes them, it piece by piece. One finger, a second finger, one limb, one leg. And before you know, the person is gone. There's really no treatment. So, and all through scriptures, it wasn't a, a, a disease that people, that Everybody gets to heal. All two scriptures, just Elisha. And then Jesus, of course, were the only two persons in the entire scriptures that healed a leper. And so leprosy was a very, very destructive or terrible ailment. And now these men come to Jesus and Jesus said to them, go and show yourself first to the priest. On their way, they found out that they were healed. And of the 10, only one came back. And scripture says he was a Samaritan. He was not a Jew. 
it was not it doesn't belong to the elect it doesn't belong to the the, the supposed favored ones and for once we see jesus bringing to fall the one of the greatest pains of the christian life ingratitude where not all ten made clean the other nine where are they were we not all alive from january 1 till now how many of us have given thanks jesus might just be asking the same thing those who have given thanks to god are they in a better position than ourselves those who are still thanking god have they and have they been more blessed than us and jesus was worried at man's ingratitude he says the other ten, the other nine, where are they? Only this Samaritan came back to give thanks. And it is instructive, dear friends, that he came back to give thanks. Now, all ten were healed, but only one was saved. All ten were healed, but only one was saved. Only one of them was saved. The one that was saved was the one that came to give thanks. Gratitude saves us. Gratitude saves us. Jesus didn't just end it there. When he came to thank God, Jesus sent them to go and meet the priest. And in obedience, they were going, and he discovered that something had just happened. He probably knew it was not the priest who did it. It was not the priest who did it. So I can always go back again to see the priest. But for now, let me go to the one who has done it. He recognizes instantly. Jesus did not wave the magic wand on their bodies. So it is also likely that the other nine took it for granted. Wow, we are well. How did it happen? And probably were not able to put a connection to Jesus. Or they probably took it for granted. Well, they say, let us go and see the priest. Let's go and see the priest and show him that we are well so that we can continue our lives. It's one of those things that has happened. Gratitude is important. Ingratitude is a hopeless disease. Ingratitude is a hopeless disease. Whenever we are ungrateful, whenever we are ungrateful, we see ourselves in that space, that conundrum. And that's why I talked about complain. When we are ungrateful, we complain almost about everything. Ingratitude opens our eyes to the things that we lack and not to the things that God does for us. Now, if you look at these 10 lepers, very quickly as I try to round up here now, you will see some similarities. So many things that happen to the 10 lepers, the similarities. All 10 of them were afflicted by a dreaded disease. All 10 of them desired that something should happen or something should be done about their ailment. All 10 of them heard about Jesus and believed that he might just be able to cure them. All 10 of them. All 10 of them came to appeal to Jesus. They acknowledged him as a rabbi. They said, Master, have mercy on me. They acknowledged him. All 10. All 10. All 10 of them, in obedience to Christ, in obedience to Christ, proceeded to see the priest. Now, let me pause a little on this fifth point, that obedience. If you go to John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 5, something happens there. At the wedding of Canaan, the wedding was going on. It was almost going to crash because the wine was running out. And the mother of Jesus who was there saw it. She was not told. A caring mother, she saw it and then she went to Jesus and said, Son, they have run out of wine. And Jesus said, Woman, what is it with me and you? What is it with me and you? My time has not come. Why are you stressing me? And Mary didn't say anything to Jesus anymore. Instead, she goes to the servant and says to them, do whatever he tells you. That is, if you want to be pleasing to God, obey God. 
If you want miracles to abound in your life, obey God. God has asked us to thank him. Jesus was not happy that nine people were ungrateful. And so, ten people were healed, but only one was saved. Because only one gave time. Obedience. Jesus said, go and see the priest. And they all went. It's important. And so, what's our level of obedience? Appreciation of what God does for us. We must be obedient to God. We must accept and do what God has said we should do. And guess what? Obedience can be tough. What did Jesus say to the servant? Go and fill those jars with water. They fill them with water. The jars were meant for ablution, not for drinking. So it didn't make sense that Jesus was asking them to fill a jar that would be used for ablution with drinking water. And they filled it with water. And Jesus said, draw some out and take to the steward. The steward was the chairman of the occasion. The servants knew they had put ordinary water there. But they remembered what Mary said. Do whatever he tells you. And so for us, brothers and sisters, in our own quest for God's blessings, especially as a parish, as you prepare for thanksgiving to God, it, it is what God has commanded us to do. He has requested us to thank him in and out of season. He has commanded us to praise him. When we, before we began, the song at the background, he has done so much for me, I cannot tell it all. If I have 10,000 tongues, it still won't be enough. And that's the truth. What is it? Whether we thank God or we don't thank God, it doesn't make God a bigger God. It helps us. And that's why we have to, we have to continue to thank God. We have to continue to live lives of thanksgiving. Very, very vital and very, very important. And then the sixth similarity is that all 10 of them were healed. All 10 were healed. But that's where it just ends. That's where it ends. That's the, that's the what you call the similarity. Now, what is the dissimilarity? The dissimilarity at that point was that only one thanked God. Sadly, their desperation made them to forget God. Their desperation made them to forget God. And why? Why did he? Uh, there are so many reasons we can adduce for why they failed to thank God. Like I said, they probably took it for granted. Secondly, maybe they were all up in their head, in their space, in their mind, and they just felt it was inconsequential to return thanks to God. Or maybe they even didn't know, they didn't realize that it was God who did it. Or again, they were more interested in being received back into the community. You know, they have been excluded. So this was going to be a form of show yourself to the priest so that you can now be included back into the society. So they were more interested in that. They were more interested in that and not in giving thanks to God. Dear friends, God laments over our own ingratitude. If you go to Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1 from verse 2 to 4, Scripture tells us, Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons, have I raised and read, but they have disowned me. An ox knows its owner. An ox knows its owner. An ass knows its manager. But Israel does not know. My people have not, understo have not understood. Ah, sinful nation. People laden with wickedness. Evil race and corrupt children. They have forsaken the Lord and spawned the Holy One of Israel and apostasy. Can you hear me? I think I went off briefly. Yes, we can hear you, Father. Okay, great. And so, Man laments, at, uh, God laments over man's ingratitude. You find that in, of course, in Isaiah chapter 1, from verse 2 to 4. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 11, it says, I came to my own, 
the Son of Man came to his own, and his own did not accept him. They did not accept him. John chapter 1, verse 11. They did not accept him. His ingratitude. They were not grateful for the gift of the Son of God into the world. Light entered the world, and we preferred darkness instead of light. That is ingratitude. How often have we been ungrateful, dear friends, to our parents, to our pastors, to our friends? Remember I said to you, not to say thank you for receiving or receive makes you a mere relation of a thief. You might not be the thief, but you, you are a cousin, you are a relative, you are a nephew or a niece or very close ties. It's just very little thing. You now become the, the, the thief. When was the last time you said thank you even to God? How do you express your thanksgiving to God? How do you express it to God? In humility, in love. One of the ways you can express your thanksgiving apart from just giving material gifts is by living a life of holiness, is by encouraging others to love God, is by loving what God loves and hating what God hates. If you love God, he says, you will keep my commandments. It's by living, by, by living a holy life. Very important, very important. Do you express your gratitude to God by helping others? Do you express your gratitude to God by being merciful and kind to your neighbor? Do you express your gratitude to God by forgiving others? Gratitude is the homage of the heart. It's a homage to the heart, which responds with graciousness in expressing an act of thanksgiving. In John's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 41, before the miracle of raising of Lazarus to life, something happened. Jesus said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. John chapter 11, verse 41. Father, I thank you for hearing me. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, St. Paul gives us this advice. He says, give thanks to God always for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God the Father. Give thanks to God always. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, Scripture tells us, and whatever you do in word and in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And in Psalm 107, verse 1, Scripture advises us, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his love endures forever. The medieval Christian mystic called Meister Eckhart, Meister Eckhart says, If the only prayer we ever say in our lifetime is, Thank you, God, that will survive. That will survive. If that's the only prayer we'll ever say to God, thank you, God, that would suffice. And to conclude, dear friends, our supreme act of thanksgiving, I'm sure we all know that, the Holy Eucharist, the Mass. And in the Mass, Jesus is the priest, Jesus is the sacrifice, and Jesus is the altar of sacrifice. And of course, Eucharist means Eucharistian, it's thanksgiving. So that is the supreme act of thanksgiving that we can offer to God. So how do you celebrate? How do you come to Mass? How do you approach the Holy Eucharist? Do you approach it with a grateful heart? Or do you stumble on it? Do you take it for granted? Do you know at every Mass, that is the highest thanksgiving we can give to God? Thanksgiving is an attitude. It's the attitude we should adopt when we worship God. Thanksgiving. And let me just put this here before I forget. When you say your prayers, when you say your prayers, do well to add songs of thanksgiving and praise. Don't pray just the verbal prayers and leave it at that. Add songs of thanksgiving and praise. It does something different. It does something different. It, it's, it's like, you know, I don't know how best to describe it. But what comes there is enormous. So do well to add songs of thanksgiving and praise when you, when you say your prayers. If that's the only thing you do, just sing songs of praise. The windows of heaven will be opened and abundance of blessings will come down upon you. Miracles happen when we praise God, when we thank him, when we thank him for everything. Thankfulness should be in the Christian heart. What do you go to church to do on Sunday? What are you going to be doing in church tomorrow? Please, I invite you to go to church and thank God. Thank God for the opportunity he has given to you to see this day. Thank God for the life he has given to you. Thank God for your priests. Thank God for your friends. 
Thank God for your fellow parishioners. Thank God for your family. Thank God for the air that you breathe. You know, if you know how much it costs to get oxygen in Lutz, you will know that there is no way you should take it for granted that you are breathing. If you know how much it costs and what it takes to be on life support, just to be alive and be breathing, you will not take living for granted. It should be a continuous outpouring and overflowing of, of love. But then I must add that gratitude is not end so cheaply. Gratitude is hard. Sometimes I have, a, I have a feeling that we are not wired to be grateful to God. We are not wired that way. So sometimes we get to forget. We are not wired. I think it's our, our sins that make it that way. That we, we need to be reminded. Or not, we shouldn't be reminded. But then it's good that we get reminded of this noble path of thanking God. With this, I've come to the end of my very brief reflection. We pray and, thank, and we pray to God that uh, our, our thanksgiving should not be just a feeling, but we should always act on it. Life of thanksgiving is a noble and the right thing to do, and it's pleasing to God. Thank you very much, and God bless you all.